we've been covering this for a while, so it's not a surprise, but obviously, uh, y you know, now three years ago, I, I remember the day fondly, three years ago, uh, Trump supporters attempted to break into the Capitol building uh, in an effort to A, stop the elector count that would have uh, certified Biden as the rightful victor in the 2020 presidential race, and B, murder people. The, uh, the, the intent to... Uh, lynch politicians who were preventing this process was not exactly a secret this now predictably we've seen kind of like a like a like a sine wave on conservative support for this you know like um initially at the very beginning and we know this because of the january 6 report donald trump knew what was happening he knew he was lying he knew he was enabling an attempted insurrection uh people were begging trump to like say something publicly to stand down to stop it you know i've covered the you know the uh the, the jan 6 uh committee reports on the stream before uh, all the evidence we have indicates clearly and with no room for doubt that it was an attempted insurrection. There's just no getting around that. Since then, conservative support has gone like up and down and up and down. You know, uh, a lot of people, a lot of conservatives performatively denounced it at the time because it was bad optics and they thought Trump was washed. But since then, and especially now, conservatives are understanding that Donald Trump is actually the only hope of their pathetic crumbling party. And for that reason, uh, support for January 6th is back on up. People like Marjorie Taylor Greene have always been pro Jan 6. They've been eulogizing and supporting the, uh, in, you know, the uh, uh, the rioters. Um, but now the mainstream conservative, you know, Republican position seems to be like, yeah, actually January 6 was good. Uh, they will alternate back and forth in between saying they weren't doing anything wrong. And, well, if they were, it was actually right. You know, they know they're lying to analyze the extent to which their dishonesty is clear. You know, I mean, here, I retweeted this. This one's, uh, this one's a classic, a modern classic. So right here, we have um, Vivek Ramaswamy, a person only relevant because he attends debates in Donald Trump's stead. And uh, you know, saying happy entrapment day, essentially saying that January 6th was an FBI uh, effort to entrap Trump supporters, it's a common conspiracy theory. You'll no you'll notice, by the way, that like th there will be some conservatives who will say it was all fake, some who will say that it was entrapment, some who will say nothing wrong happened, and some who will openly say, "Yeah, we wanted to do an insurrection; it was good." And all of them will get along. Like those are four completely mutually exclusive beliefs, and conservatives will believe one or several or all of them and get along because they all know that they're lying. Anyway, here's um, Vivek back in 2021. This might be controversial to say, but I think that when I saw the disgrace that unfolded at the footsteps of the Capitol on January 6th, I, I cried. I was in tears when I watched on television that day. So again, you, you can do stuff like that with like all of them. Basically, again, they're all liars. None of them believe anything. They're fascists. They don't believe in truth. They're anti-empiricists. They're demons. They're inhuman. Uh, they want to put you in a death camp. They want you dead. You know, we are literally talking about conservatives defending their insurrectionary attempt. I mean, this is beer hall put shit, right? Like what are, what stakes get higher than fascists running for election telling you the last time they attempted to seize power violently, uh, you know, we'll get you next time. It's pretty straightforward. Anyhow, in the face of all of that, we have the strongest president to have ever lived, champion of liberalism, a warrior for the institution. Biden did a January 6th speech. What's up, Biden? This is not Biden. The adrenochrome hitting good? Democracy. Get out of here. Get, you're not Biden. You're not Biden. Well, thank you. And, and, if, you, and if you have um, any, any leadership ready and willing to, to defeat fascism, uh, it would be, you know, uh, that which arrives at the podium uh, to Hamilton music. What is that? The world turned upside down? Uh, okay. This is this is the song about the uh, uh, America defeating the British in the Revolutionary War. That's what's happening right now, you know. I, actually, just to rub it into the British, I do believe that like basically all patriotic celebrations should be like a celebration of our victory over the British. You know, like no matter how many hundreds of years in the past it was. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. 
please. Thank you very, very much. Today, uh, we're gonna we're gonna go to one point two times. That feels like a like a like a good compromise. The topic of my speech today is deadly serious, and He's talking uh, I think it fast. needs to be made at the outset of this campaign. In the winter of 1777, it was harsh and cold as the Continental Army marched to Valley Forge. General George Washington knew he faced the most daunting of tasks, to fight and win a war against the most powerful empire existent in the world at the time. So this is why we did the Hamilton. His song. mission was clear. Liberty, not conquest. Freedom, not domination. National independence, not individual glory. America made a vow, never again would we bow down to a king. Months ahead would be incredibly difficult. But General Washington knew something in his bones, something about the spirit of the troops he was leading, something, something about the soul of the nation he was struggling to be born. In his general order, he predicted, and I quote, with one heart and one mind, with fortitude and with patience, they would overcome every difficulty, the troops he was leading. And they did. They did. This army that lacked blankets and food, clothes and shoes, this army whose march left bloody bare footprints in the snow, this ragtag army made up of ordinary people, their mission, George Washington declared, was nothing less than a sacred cause. That was the phrase he used, a sacred cause. Freedom, liberty, democracy, American democracy. I just visited the grounds of Valley Forge. I've been there a number of times since the time I was a Boy Scout years ago. You know, it's to be clear, this is uh, a historical. Um, the fa the formation of the United States it was not a clear verdict on the extent to which it would be democratic. I mean, obviously, only landowning white men could vote to begin with, but even then. There were plenty of people who wanted to essentially just make George Washington a king after he won, considering he was the ruling general. Uh, you know, um, they weren't really fighting for democracy. Uh, the, uh, you know, it was a sort of um, landowning uh, aristocracy in the colonies that wanted, uh, you know, they, a, a bunch of sort of petty generals and leaders in the American colonies uh, felt like they weren't being given their due and wanted to exercise full control without the king breathing down their neck. And so they did, you know. You know, George Washington himself personally did believe in a democracy. Yeah, but things very, very well could have worked out differently. Didn't Hamilton want King Washington? Yes, Alexander Hamilton was uh, was essentially, you know, a monarchist. Um, thought that the common men couldn't lead their own affairs, wanted Washington to serve for life, uh, and so on. The very site that I think every American should visit, because it tells a story of the pain and the suffering and the true patriotism it took to make America. Today, we gather in a new year, some 246 years later, just one day before January 6th. A day forever shared our memory because it was on that day. Hamilton was inconsistent as Bosch. He was only briefly a monarchist. He was convinced off that after a few months. Yeah, but he argued for it at the Continental Congress, right? I mean, he, he was definitely an advocate for it, like, in, in, in some pretty meaningful ways. He was part of the opposition, uh, kind of where it counts, right? I mean, he, he shifted around, you know. He also died young, uh, famously, you know. Some, somebody made a play about that, so, you know, maybe if he had gotten really old, he could have written some sort of final perspective on the issue, but... So we nearly lost America. Lost it all. Today, we're here to answer the most important of questions. Is democracy still America's sacred cause? I mean it. This is not rhetorical, academic. Some or historians believe he did that to push back against the article. Okay, now we're, we're entering now a level of knowledge that I do not have. Uh, I, I have no choice but to take you and, and Benjamin uh, at face value. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was actually a woke communist or something. Uh, let's leave it at this. Hypothetical. Whether democracy is still America's sacred cause is the most urgent question of our time. And it's what the 2024 election is all about. The choice is clear. Donald Trump's campaign is about him, not America, not you. Donald Trump's campaign is obsessed there are none, with the past, not the future. He's willing to sacrifice our democracy 
put himself in power. Our campaign is different. For me and Kamala, our campaign is about America. It's about you. It's about every age and background that occupy this country. I think this is another weakness of liberalism, and I will be doing rhetorical critique here. Uh, like the fascist, uh, Biden begins his speech on why he must win with a historical allegory. The problem is that when a fascist invokes national history as a way of uh, winning support from the people listening, it's purely a vibes thing. Fascists will talk about the past that never existed, you know? Like, George Washington did exist, sure, but take a look at your average Roman statue Twitter avatar account and the way they talk about the past. They're just talking about a fantasy world. Like, they're, it's all vibes stuff. There's nothing real there. So, Feeling does excite people to action. The problem is that liberals don't actually care about Washington. The only people who actually care about, like, the American myth and institutional power to the extent that uh, they would be swayed by listening to Biden, you know, uh, romantically talk about George Washington, we're already going to vote for George, or sorry, we're already going to vote for Biden anyway. They, they're they already on his side. Um I don't, I don't feel like this is a good motivator to action. I think that it would be much better to lean towards populism, the thing everybody's doing right now, with a, listen, you know, you love your, your, your nice safe home. You love your family, right? They're going to kill you, Jack. They're going to kill you, Jack. Take, take a look at the GOP. Look at them. Look what they're doing. They're going to kill you. They're going to eat you, you know? Um, there are plenty of rhetorical approaches that would be more effective than, like, I don't know, jerking off the founding father. Especially since Founding Father worship is actively um, kind of repulsive to a lot of younger voters, especially, you know? Basically, if you're 20 or younger, it's pretty much guaranteed that at some point you've shared a classroom with somebody who interrupted a historical lesson of the Founding Fathers with, but they were slavers, which they were. About the future, we're going to continue to build together. And our campaign is about preserving and strengthening our American democracy. Three years ago tomorrow, History, we okay. saw with our own eyes the violent mob stormed the United States Capitol. It was almost in disbelief as you first turned on the television. I was, yeah. For the first time in our history, insurrectionists had come to stop the peaceful transfer, transfer of power in America. First time, smashing windows, shattering doors, attacking the police. Outside, gallows were erected as the MAGA crowd chanted, hang Mike Pence. Inside, they hunted for Speaker Pelosi. The House was chanting as they marched through and smashed windows. Where's Nancy? Over 140 police officers were injured. Jill and I attended the funeral of police officers who died as a result of the events of that day. Because, Donald, because of Donald Trump's lies, they died because these lies brought a mob to Washington. He promised it would be wild, and it was. He told the crowd to fight like hell, and all hell was unleashed. He promised he would write them, write them, everything they did. He would be side by side with them. Then, as usual, he, write with them? he left the dirty work to others. He retreated to the White House. As America was attacked from within, Donald Trump watched on TV in a private small dining room off, my oval, oval, off the Oval Office. He said off my Oval Office, like, this bitch was in my house. The entire nation watched in horror. The whole world watched in disbelief. And Trump did nothing. Members of his staff, members of his family, Republican leaders who were under attack for the, at that very moment, pled with him, act, call off the mob. Imagine had he gone out and said, stop. And still, Trump did nothing. It was among the worst derelictions of duty by a president in American history. Duty. An attempt to overturn a free and fair election by force and violence. A record 81 million people voted for my candidacy and to end his presidency. Trump lost the popular vote by 7 million. Trump's claims about the 2020 election never could stand up in court. Trump lost 60 court cases, 60. Trump lost the Republican control states. Trump lost before a Trump appointed judge and then judges. And I know that everyone watching this, or at least most people watching this, are already on my side with this, and it feels like a kind of unnecessary repetition, but if at some point you want to remind yourself and go through my stream coverage of the January 6 uh, committee hearings, or just the hearings themselves, if you want less uh, jokes, interruptions, irreverent commentary, stupid, you know, 
you, you know, if you want less of that, you can just watch the thing itself. Don't ever let them uh, uh, trick you. Um, what happened was evil and blatant in more ways than you remember. You're thinking right now, you're nodding. Oh, no, I remember how bad it was. No, you don't. Your brain, no human brain could keep all that information and memorize it. Every moment, those committee hearings, I mean, nobody could keep it all in their head. Could make many books from it. The extent to which we are right and they are wrong is, it, it, it's not even like a debate topic. Like you, you, because you could, I could never say all of that in a seven or 10 or 15 minute opening. You know, it's not even, it's, we are so right. And they are so, so evil. Trump lost before the United States Supreme Court. All of it, he lost. <clears throat> Trump lost recount after recount after recount and state after state. But in desperation and weakness, Trump and his MAGA followers went after election officials who, in, who ensured your power as a citizen would be heard. These public service had their lives forever upended by attacks and death threats for simply doing their jobs. In Atlanta, Georgia, a brave black mother and her daughter, Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, were doing their jobs electing workers until Donald Trump and his MAGA followers targeted and threatened them, forcing them from their homes mm -hmm. and unleashing racist vitriol on them. Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Yeah, those, those two. I, I think the daughter left her house for like two months because she was getting so many death threats. The conservatives, there was just video footage of her doing her job um, counting ballots, and the conservatives pointed at it, and they were like, oh, she's cheating. That, that, that thing she just did with her hand, that was actually the election being stolen right there. Um, and she had to flee her house uh, for fear of her life because uh, so many conservatives were sending her death threats. We just hit with a $148 million judgment for cruelty and defamation that he inflicted against them. Other state and local elected officials across the country face similar personal attacks. In addition, Fox News agreed to pay a record eight, $787 million for the lies they told about voter fraud. Let's be clear about the 2020 election. Trump exhausted every legal avenue available to him to overturn the election, every one. But the legal path just took Trump back to the truth that I'd won the election and he was a loser. Ah, it's a, it's, this is a flex speech. There we go. Well, so knowing how his mind works now, he had one, he had one act left, one desperate act available to him, the violence of January the 6th. And since that day, more than 1,200 people have been charged for their assault on the Capitol. Nearly 900 of them have been convicted or pled guilty. More. Collectively to date, they have been sentenced to more than 840 years in prison. More. And what's Trump done? Instead of calling them criminals, he's called these, these insurrectionists patriots. They're patriots. Yeah, we're going to cover the uh, portions of the Trump speech after this. And um, hold on, let me see if I can just really quickly, just for the, the juxtaposition, let me find that. Um, that uh, what he say? What he say? Show me what I like. What I like? Show me. Show me. Oh, yeah, here we go. He was pleading for Joe Biden to release the January 6 hostages. Remember, Donald Trump uh, initially for a time had to play at contrition with what happened at January 6th, you know. Um, but now that the GOP is fully consolidated behind him again, this is the kind of rhetoric we get. Whoop. What they ought to do? They ought to release the J6 hostages. They've suffered enough. They ought to release them. I call them hostages. Some people call them prisoners. I call them hostages. They both had speeches on January 6. Joe Biden, of course, to condemn it. And Donald Trump, in addition to it being a general rally, to just endorse it. Like, that, that's where we're at, by the way. Uh, Joe Biden's popularity uh, is tanking at the moment. It's incredibly low. And the opposition candidate is just open, like, just celebrating. 
Release the J6 hostages, Joe. Release him, Joe. You can do it real easy, Joe. This guy, what he's done, what he's done to people. And Ant what they've done. And Antifa. And he promised to pardon them if he returns to office. Trump said that there was a lot of love on January the 6th. The rest of the nation, including law enforcement, saw a lot of hate and violence. One Capitol Police officer called it a medieval battle. The thing that really gets me is the inconsistency. I think that this is, this is often a problem with dealing with evil, not just with fascism, where people struggle to reconcile the idea that a person can be that bad, you know? Like, this is actually something that frequently um, leads to psychiatric issues with medical uh, personnel like um, first responders uh, and police detectives, you know? Like, you'll, 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 uh, like, wasn't there a rapper, an old rapper? It turns out they were keeping a woman locked in the garage to rape her for five years or something, you know? Like, a cop will overturn something like that, find out about that, and they'll just have, like, a viper? That's it, yeah. A cop will turn over something like that, and they'll just have, like, a little, like, a little mental fracture, because the idea is, like, well, how can people be like that? Why would anyone be like that, you know? Why, why would a fascist, you know, lie in 15 different ways, in, 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 in mutually irreconcilable ways? You know, why? Why any of this? Why would anyone support this? Why don't people look at this and see how crazy it is? Why don't people understand how wrong he is? Um, now, uh, I think that the, the liberal inclination in situations like this is to overfixate on it to try to see if there's like a wedge or some logic or pattern that can be worked out. I think the right thing to do in a lot of cases sometimes is to uh, accept that if they're not going to put the effort into rationalizing it, neither should you, you know? You don't need to sociologically um, analyze every element of every person's behavior. It's not possible to. You just need to focus on what's productive. And if it's not productive to, you know, constantly dive into, well, I don't know, why did this guy murder a kid then cut them up into a bunch of pieces? Let me really think on it. Well, do you have to? Maybe leave that to their personal psychologist once they're in prison. You know, you don't have to. You just have to make sure they're in prison. You got to arrest them or whatever else. Um, and that's, that's kind of the deal here. You know, there will be plenty of time for us to dissect the, the roots the nerves and circulatory system of this fascist movement. And we have to a large extent. I think this channel has been pretty good about uh, diving into that and critically analyzing it in ways that help us understand and combat it. But at the end of the day, our job is to win more than it is to understand. Understanding and then losing nets us nothing. So just keep that in mind. You know, you can... You, you may feel a, a temptation to despair, but your, your job here is to win. That same officer called vile rape, was called vile racist names. He said he was more afraid in the capital of the United States of America, in the chambers, than when he was fighting as a soldier in the war in Iraq. He said he was more afraid inside the halls of Congress than fighting in the war in Iraq. And trying to rewrite the facts of January 6th, Trump is trying to steal history the same way he tried to steal the election. But he, we knew the truth because we saw it with our own eyes. This wasn't like something, a story being told. It was on television repeatedly. We saw it with our own eyes. Trump's mob was not a peaceful protest. It was a violent assault. They were insurrectionists, not patriots. They weren't there to uphold the Constitution. They were there to destroy the Constitution. Trump won't do what an American president must do. He refuses to denounce political violence. So hear me clearly. I'll say what Donald Trump won't. Political violence is never, ever acceptable in the United States political system. Never, never, never. It has no place in a democracy, none. It can't be pro-insurrectionist and pro-American. And yet Trump and his MAGA supporters not only embrace political violence, but they laugh about it. At his rally, he jokes about an intruder whipped up by the big Trump lie, taking a hammer to Paul Pelosi's skull and echoing the very same words used on January 6th. Where's Nancy? 
and he thinks that's funny. He laughed about it. Yeah, that's another good symptom of the times when Paul Pelosi was attacked by a random lunatic Nazi. The right, to a man, just made fun of it, you know? Like, with... It, it wasn't even, like, a controversial thing for, for them to do. Like, all of them just agreed, like, yeah, uh, assassination attempts on our opponents, uh, uh, you know, uh, people being sort of bludgeoned half to death uh, when they're the opposition leadership. You know, that's funny. You know, that's that's something we'll joke about. There was never there was never even, like, a deliberation on whether or not it was optically bad for them to do that, you know? What a sick... <laughs> My God. What a sick I, I think it's despicable, seriously. Not just repressive for any person to say that. But to say it to the whole world listening. When I was overseas, anyway. Oh, yeah. Trump's assault on democracy isn't just part of his past. It's what he's promising for the future. He's being straightforward. He's not hiding the ball. His first rally for the 2024 campaign opened with a choir of January 6th insurrectionists singing from prison on a cell phone, while images of the January 6th riot played on a big screen behind him at his rally. Can you believe that? This is like something out of a fairy tale, a bad fairy tale. Trump began his 2024 campaign by glorifying the failed violent insurrectionist insurrection at our, on our capital. The guy who claims law and order sows lawlessness and disorder. Trump's not concerned about your future, I promise you. Trump is now promising a full-scale campaign of revenge and retribution, his words, for some years. I, I think a big issue rhetorically with this and with the Democrats' approach broadly is that it's always framed as a Trump thing when it is fully an entire political party and about a third the population of this country falling in line with a fascist agenda that Trump is the convenient figurehead of, but is not even the ideological center of, like not even close. Donald Trump is not, this is like people say, Trumpism isn't an ideology. Trumpism is an alignment, you know? Like the, the ideals that are driving the GOP are fully just a cabal of uh, just white supremacist or nationalist billionaires um, that have been funneling money into conservative political causes for literal decades, not even a conspiracy. It's open. It's very clear um, it, with, with the intention of preserving their capital interest um, by keeping the, uh, the Republicans uh, extremely anti-taxes, uh, pro-privatization. Uh, and how do you do that most effectively? Well, it's not very effective running as a politician purely on the basis that you're going to cut taxes for the wealthy. So you have to run on social issues. And guys, you'll never guess which social issues billionaires will pay you to push uh, alongside their um, pro-business preferences. You know, it, it's that. Trump is just the loud, boisterous, uh, you know, sort of charisma vacuum that ended up being at the head of this movement. If Trump didn't exist, somebody else would have been Trump. Um, you know, all the material forces that are pushing in this direction, they're, they, they continue regardless. Come. They were his words, not mine. He went on to say he'd be a dictator on day one. I mean, if I write in a book of fiction, I said, an American president said that, and not in jest. He called in, I quote, the termination. He did say that, by the way. Donald Trump uh, made a joke that he wouldn't be a dictator if he got back in power, except on day one. Um, this is vague enough to be interpreted in a bunch of different ways. Uh, obviously, you know, people have sort of waved that off as him being like, oh, he's being facetious or whatever. But uh, the more radical elements of the right wing have interpreted this as uh, the um, the storm, the QAnon, uh, essentially the day of the rope. Uh, the Donald Trump is signaling that once he attains power, the first day will be his enemies hanging from lampposts. And then after that, he can be, you know, America's true leader uh, because he's he's purged the deep state. Quote, this is a quote, the termination of all the rules, regulation and articles, even those found in the U.S. Constitution should be terminated if fits his will. It's really kind of hard to believe. Even found in the Constitution, he could terminate? 
He's threatened the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff with the death penalty. Says he should be put to death because the chairman put his oath to the Constitution ahead of his personal loyalty to Trump. This is coming from a president who called, when he visited his cemeteries, called dead soldiers suckers and losers. Remember that? Sometimes I'm really happy the Irish should be can't be seen. <laughs> Good bit. It was right around the time I was at Bo's grave, Tommy. How dare he? Who in God's name does he think he is? With former aides, Trump plans to invoke the Insurrections Act, the Insurrection Act, which will allow him to deploy, which is not allowed to do in ordinary circumstances, allow him to deploy U.S. military forces on the streets of America. He said it. He calls those who oppose him vermin. He talks about the blood of America as being poisoned, echoing the same exact language used in Nazi Germany. He proudly posts on social media the words that best describe his 2024 campaign, quote, My policy of making constant comparisons to the Nazis vindicated by the president of the United States. Thank you. Love, love to see this uh, straight from the top at long last. After, after five years of watching my channel, now at long last, uh, Biden is taking the pointers. Revenge, quote, power, and quote, dictatorship. There's no confusion about who Trump is, what he intends to do. I placed my hand on our family Bible, and I swore an oath on the very same steps of the Capitol, just 14 days after the attack on January the 6th. As I looked out over the capital city, whose streets were lined with National Guard to prevent another attack, I saw an American that had been pushed to the brink, America that had been pushed to the brink. But I felt enormous pride, not in winning, I felt enormous pride in America because American democracy had been tested. American democracy had held together. And when Trump had seen weakness in our democracy and continued to talk about it, I saw strength, your strength. It's not hyperbole, your strength, your integrity, American strength and integrity, ordinary citizens, state election officials, the American judicial system had put the Constitution first and sometimes at their peril, at their peril. Because of them, because of you, the will of the people prevailed. Not the anger of the mob or the appetites of one man. This is another weakness. Um, we're, 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 we're going for competing emotional impulses here. We've talked at length about what drives the far right, um, or the right broadly, I guess. Um, but again, this liberal appeal to like the institutions won will never hit as hard as what the opposition is telling themselves, you know? Nobody, not even the most wonk of liberals in America, are getting up out of bed every day burning with a fire of American institutions. That's not that's not what they're doing. Trust me, right now in America, there are millions of people who every moment of their waking day are thinking about how the presence of black and brown people in their cities is tearing their country apart. I promise you there is nothing about liberal institutionalism that can match the uh, near religious fervor of fascist indoctrination, you know, which is why you have to match populism with populism. You can't beat populist rhetoric with institutional rhetoric. It, it doesn't work. The institutional rhetoric if anything, complements and serves to bolster the fascist rhetoric because those are the institutions that they are galvanizing people against. You know, you're not really combating them. If anything, you're kind of making their point to them and to a different audience, you're being milk toast. Sure, American ideals preserve, right? But who cares about American ideals? Let's talk about what they would do. You know, he said they would be a dictator. Okay, like, let's talk realistically. Like, you don't have to be me and bring up death camps, sure. Maybe that's more of a hardcore Vauchite tactic, but, you know, it's pretty clear what they want to do. 
You can talk at length about the end of American democracy, how this could very well be the last election. Fearmonger, it's not even fearmongering, really. It's true. If they won, there is a legitimate chance it would be the last real election, at least for a while. You know, there's plenty to talk about here, and institutional strength, I just, I don't think should factor into it as like a major component of how you're selling this to people, how you're energizing people. The attack on January 6th happened. There was no doubt about the truth. At the time, even Republican members of Congress and Fox News commentators publicly and privately condemned the attack. Could you list some positives about the speech? Um, for the most part, the speech is pretty good. I'm just, I'm, I'm putting forward the criticisms because there's usually more to say critically than there is positively. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah, for, for, it's, it's quite good for him. Also, Biden isn't using institutional rhetoric. He literally said, you were strong, the American people were strong, we were resilient, and we did not break. That's pretty populist. Um, to an extent, it's, it, it's, it's very milquetoast populism. I, I, I will acknowledge that what he's saying is not entirely institutionalist, but he's definitely still leaning on to an extent that I think is counterproductive. But, you know, I, I, I agree with you. It's not, it's not fully 100% like institutionalist. We're not at Pete Buttigieg levels. As one Republican senator said, Trump's behavior was embarrassing and humiliating for the country. But now that same senator and those same people have changed their tune. As time has gone on, gone on, politics, fear, money, all have intervened. And now these MAGA voices who know the truth about Trump on January 6th have abandoned the truth and abandoned the democracy. They made their choice. Now the rest of us, Democrats, independents, mainstream Republicans, we have to make our choice. I know mine, and I believe I know America's. We'll defend the truth, not give in to the big lie. We'll embrace the Constitution and the Declaration, not abandon it. So this, this is what I mean. Um, this is what I mean by institutionalism. This is a deference to concepts like the Constitution, or I should say to truth. Um, people don't get motivated to do anything for the truth. You know, the truth is a kind of abstract, it's, it's effective on an interpersonal level, but we're talking, what are people willing to die for? And the answer is rarely the truth, usually for family or country or some specific anxiety or whatever. The truth is always complicated enough that people are going to get a bit kind of like trepidatious around it. Nobody wants to beat Republicans because they care about the truth. I'll be clear. I think the truth is great, okay? The main reason I want the Republicans to lose is so they don't kill us. That's the main reason. It, like, if, 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 like, the truth, the relative truth values, you could arrange a situation in which the Republicans are mostly truthful, but are also genocidal. And the rhetoric around their genocide is, is, is fairly straightforward. Like, they just say it. And the Democrats are milk toast and middlingly honest in the way that they sometimes are. And in that case, you know, truth would still be because it's because the truth isn't the operating factor here. The genocide is the main thing I'm avoiding. So, yeah, I, I, it's it's about what gets people up out of out of bed in the morning. You'll look every political ideology claims to hold a monopoly on the truth. Right. That's kind of the point of an ideology to a to a large extent. OK, but for the most part. You don't really see Republicans galvanizing people off of calls like this, right? It's not about stuff like, you know, yeah, we need to win so the truth prevails. Not usually stuff like that. It's usually a lot more, you know, gritty, a lot more like personal and, and bloody, you know. We need to win so they don't destroy our nation. We need to win, you know, so the, the deep state doesn't prevail. The truth is implicit, but there's usually something a bit more pressing than the truth itself they're pushing for, you know? will honor the sacred cause of democracy, not walk away from it. Today, I make this sacred pledge to you, the defense, protection, and preservation of American democracy will remain as it has been, the central cause of my presidency. This is a bit of an aside, but what do you think the GOP will do that's uh, going to be genocidal? If the GOP had full control uh, over the country, uh, you know, which they could very well get with enough maneuvering if they won in the presidential, um, then uh, at the very least, absolute minimum, we'd be talking about 4 transitioning for trans people. 
um, a very high probability, at least in some areas, of um, sort of mandatory conversion camps. Uh, that's not exactly historically unprecedented. We would also probably see a promotion of broader anti-sodomy laws. Uh, the uh, AG of Texas has flatly just said he would do that, you know, arrest people for being gay. So it, at, at bare minimum, there is, there is a pretty strong... There's a, a pretty strong ba baseline for the assumption that they're a broad, just like arresting of queer people uh, or, or or detaining or whatever. Um, that And that's just what they admit to, by the way. Um, during the BLM protests, uh, A.G. Barr talked about uh, invoking sedition charges against protesters. It's very likely that like what's happening right now in Argentina, they would just arrest you for protesting. So you could say goodbye to any First Amendment rights in a practical sense. Um, they would keep that. There would probably be mostly undocumented atrocities against the undocumented population. Uh, an, an enormous amount of money would be spent on security forces down on the southern border, both for wall construction, sure, but also in, in all likelihood for mass uh, uh, mistreatment, deportation, or in some cases killing um, of uh, uh, the, uh, migrants coming up from the southern border. There would probably also be pogroms in southern towns that have large populations of undocumented people, you know, accusations flying wild. These are just off the top, but like things get in and they get worse, you know? Uh, it, it, what I've listed is, is not even close to being comprehensive, but even the threat of these elements is enough, I think, to, um, you know, warrant the highest, uh, the, the highest possible level of, of caution with the, with the GOP. That roving death squads comment, that's not a joke. Oh, no, not, no, not, not at all. Um, the, there are plenty of right-wing groups uh, operating locally uh, in Texas that essentially have the backing or at least the verbal support of local Republican leaders that essentially are just like local death squads, yeah. They, at the moment, can't get away with the worst things they want to do, though they have gotten away with some stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Plans if slash when things go south, you're leaving the country. Well, thanks to you guys, I am a multi-billionaire. So yeah, I would I would probably go to uh, yeah I don't know go I'd go to sort of uh, sort of an ice fortress in uh, in 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 Greenland. You know, the moon, perhaps. America, as we began this election year. We must be clear, democracy is on the ballot. Your freedom is on the ballot. <clears throat> yes, we'll be voting on many issues. On the freedom to vote and have your vote counted. On the freedom of a choice. The freedom to have a fair shot. The freedom from fear. <clears throat> and we'll debate and disagree. Without democracy, no progress is possible. Think about it. The alternative to democracy is dictatorship. Elanita Express, I think that Texas is very capable of shifting blue with some uh, effective and intelligent investment. Um, Texas, if, if there wasn't shenanigans during the 2020 election with um, the removal of ballot boxes in predominantly black and brown areas, um, Texas would have been within a few points of being a Dem state. Um, like, not far at all. So voter suppression is necessary for them to keep the lid on at the moment, but Texas is going to get more blue with every election. You know why? I'll tell you why. For one, immigrants. And for two, uh, West Coast expats who want to flee the high real estate prices of Los Angeles, San Francisco, etc. to head over to the tech havens of Houston and Austin. Those populations are going up quite a lot, and those motherfuckers are not voting red, at least not most of them. Um, demographically, Texas has a very decent likelihood of shifting to blue um, sometime soon if they're allowed to. The rule of one, not the rule of we the people. Yes, they are, Super That's what guys. the soldiers of Valley Forge understood. And so was me. What's what, what we have to understand it as well. We've been blessed so long with a strong, stable democracy. It's easy to forget. And I agree with that, Rivera. Why so least many before us risked their lives and strengthened democracy? What our lives would be without it? 
Democracy means having the freedom to speak your mind. To be this is you this is liberal hope warbling. I don't respect this. If Texas shifts blue, doesn't that lock Republicans out of the presidency permanently? Um, not fully, but a little bit. Yeah, I certainly Texas going blue would be like a monstrously difficult challenge for them to overcome. I, I mean, it's possible if they could do some, you know, Midwest sweep in spite of it. But no, if if Texas goes blue, man, that's th yeah, that 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 would be very difficult for them to deal with. How would the Republicans even win post uh, Blexus? Well, they'll kill you. That was their last plan. They didn't win in 2020, and their strategy after that was to, you know, kill the opposition, seize power, and uh, put forward a Trump dictatorship. You know, as long as the GOP exists and has institutional power, you can't count them out because fascists are willing to do whatever it takes to win. Unlike liberals, unlike institutionalists, um, you know, the GOP might have no chance of winning in a straight shot. But how many rules are they willing to break? Or they could just kill you. You don't need 50% of the country to get behind a coup. You look at the history of, of, of coups, you know, it rarely requires even a tiny fraction of that. Again, though, in terms of like big shifts right now, the, the, the main thing that people should be optimistic about as a kind of, um, you know, warding mechanism is the fact that the Pentagon is uh, generally quite neoliberal and institutionalist. Those guys don't like the modern GOP that much, you know? The top brass at the Pentagon are all, you know, stiff upper lip uh, West Point graduates. They're very well educated. They're very, um, very, very, very drilled in with, uh, you know, the, uh, the order and decorum and responsibility. Uh, the military culture over at the Pentagon, at the moment at least, seems to strongly incline them against uh, GOP takeover. Same with the FBI, to an extent. I got shit for saying this exact thing to my friends. Then your friends are wrong and should look more into the issue. Uh, the disposition of the military changes massively depending on the country. Historically, in some countries, um, you know, the, the military has been essentially just another, like, fascist, like, wing. Uh, not the case here, you know. Things vary. Wasn't there a peaceful socialist revolution in Africa? Uh, what was that? Was the, the, the Carnelian, the car, the, it's the flower, the something, flower revolution. What, what was it called? Yeah, this was, this was like the, um, one of the biggest dubs socialist uh, revolutionaries ever got. It was an actual military-backed peaceful revolution. This was like some hippie shit, you know? A military coup by left-leaning military officers that overthrew the authoritarian Estado Novo government in 1974 in Lisbon, producing major social, economic, territorial, demographic, and political changes in Portugal. Oh, not in Africa, in Portugal, my apologies. And its overseas colonies through the Proceso Revoluc Revolucionario M. Corso. It resulted in the Portuguese transition to democracy and the end of the Portuguese colonial war. Remember, folks, when leftists win, good things happen. When people on the right wing, bad things happen. Every time, all the time. Well, not every time. But it's known to happen. The Carnation Revolution got its name from the fact that almost no shots were fired, and from a restaurant worker, Celeste Cairo, offering carnations to the soldiers when the population took to the streets to celebrate the end of the dictatorship. And with other demonstrators following suit and carnations placed in the muzzles of guns in the soldiers' uniform. Didn't, uh, this is what we did in, uh, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the university, but when the soldiers shot the, uh, Kent State, that was it, Kent State. How'd that go for Kent State? Yeah, I better make sure the people on the other side are, are left-leaning, I guess. Or Michael Jackson did it, too. To be. And Khloe Kardashian. Democracy is about being able to bring about peace. Bosh, the vast majority of the military is absolutely not liberal amount. I can tell that your IQ is flagging somewhat, wilting in the sun uh, from the all caps. But to remind, I'm not saying the whole military is liberal. I'm saying the brass at the Pentagon have a neoliberal bent. Look into it if you want to. Kylie Kardashian, not Khloe. Okay, I can't tell them apart. Why wouldn't the military and Pentagon reasonably believe they can ride out a U.S. fascist takeover? Be because what I'm saying is the Pentagon, first of all, if a coup happens, the Pentagon has to sign off on it. There is nothing that happens in this country that does not happen with the implicit permission of the Pentagon. That you breathe means they allowed you to. It's the Pentagon. So they're not going to ride anything out. They get to decide who's in charge. In, in, in matters of 
constitutional instability, the person with the most guns gets to decide who's in charge, and the military has the most guns by far. Uh, so, and the biggest ones. So they would, uh, and, and at the moment, it seems like the Pentagon is correctly of the opinion that whatever values they do have would be better served by an actual liberal democracy and not by a populist fascist takeover. Change. Democracy. Democracy is how we've opened the doors of opportunity wider and wider. But Trump can nominate his own Pentagon. He'd be the president now. Well, no. If, if, if Donald Trump sees the power illegitimately, the Pentagon probably wouldn't respect his order to step down. Uh, they would handle it. Also, he can't just pick the Pentagon. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that. But if he started, if he, if he sees power illegitimately and started being dictatorial, um, the Pentagon is both extremely capable of stopping him and seems to be willing to. Mark Millet was literally making plans to stop a Trump coup during the run-up in January 6th. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. The wokest uh, general. T to give you an idea um, of the threat they feel is present within the Pentagon, uh, Donald Trump has made comments implying he wants uh, uh, Millet executed. And uh, Paul Gosar, the um, Republican congressman who's friends with Nick Fuentes, just flat out said that he should be hanged. Well, he actually said hung, but the, um, the, the yeah, it's hanged, actually. Ah, uh, last wish. You have the right link? Ah, uh, here we go. They're not going to succeed. Top generals fear Trump would attempt to coup after election, according to a new book. Where's that quote that you provided? They may try, but they're not going to succeed. You can't do this without the military. You can't do this without the CIA and the FBI. We're the guys with the guns. That is true. He is correct. If there's one thing I know about the military... He, they do have a lot of guns. Each successive generation, not with, notwithstanding our mistakes. But if democracy falls, we'll lose that freedom. We'll lose the power of we, the people, to shape our destiny. If you doubt me, look around the world. Travel with me as I meet with other heads of state throughout the world. Lol, 100% of right-wingers own guns. Hello, person who recently made an account. Uh, that's not true, but let's say it is. So... Uh, the United States military has big guns. Very big guns. All right. Look at the authoritarian leaders and dictators Trump says he admires. He out loud says he admires. I won't go through them all. It'll take too long. Look, remember how he refers, what he, where he refers to what he calls love letter exchanges between he and the dictator of North Korea? Those women and men out there in the audience ever fought for the American... Well, we, we do support critically Donald Trump's efforts to um, build a bridge with Juchist hero uh, Kim Jong-il. Would you ever believe you'd hear a president say something like that? His admiration. It's okay, Jake. We love for you. Putin. I could go on. And look at what these autocrats are doing to limit freedom in their countries. The limited freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom to assemble, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, people are going to jail, so much more. It's true, the push and pull of American history is not a fairy tale. Every Bosh, there are pretty, probably more people like General Flynn in there, and the foot soldiers are like 80% conservative MAGA types. That's actually not true. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure from the last polling that I saw, um, the majority of the military lean Democrat. What's more, to the extent that conservatives do exist within the military, I don't know how many of them or what proportion of them would be like Trumpist, like hardline Trump supporters, you know? Um, my guess is that it wouldn't be a very significant portion of it. I, uh, uh, you know, it, it, things, people, people, people project a lot of assumptions onto the military. It's a very complicated environment. Um, and yeah, and military leadership are, are significant. So yeah, keep, okay, yeah, two big points. First of all, the brass of the Pentagon, military leadership, are college-educated. College-educated people are not very likely to be, like, hardcore conservatives. Um, that sounds dumb, but it's not. There is a sort of, like, institutional respect that gets grained into you at West Point or whatever else. Um, that, that is, you know, it's, it's, it's literally like brainwashing. That's the point, is the military. Uh, and that, that is difficult to, um, to overcome. Additionally, please keep in mind... That uh, the average age of your, what, like rank and file member of the military has to be, I mean, we're talking like young people here, 18, 19, 20, 21, like young people. 
take a look at the political interests of uh, young people, you know? They're pulling from the wokest demographic in history. Admittedly, it's mostly men, not men and women. Um, but, you know, there are, it, 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 there are, it's, it's complicated, is the thing I'm saying. Um, it's complicated. The real threat would be armed police. Yeah, it's a civilian uprisings. But again, the military signs off on everything implicitly, so. Stride forward in America is met with ferocious backlash many times from those who fear progress and those who exploit that fear for their own personal gain. From those who traffic in lies told for power and profit. For those who are driven by grievance and grift, consumed by conspiracy and victimhood. From those who seek to bury history and ban books. Do you ever think you'd be in a political event? Dude, he looks like a Star Trek alien. Holy shit, he's so old, man. Oh my god. His skin is paper thin. Talking about book banning for presidential and the presidential election. The choice and contest between those forces those competing forces between solidarity and division is perennial. But this time it's so different. You can't have a contest. You can't have a contest if you see politics as an all-out war instead of a peaceful way to resolve our differences. All-out war is what Trump wants. And that's why he doesn't understand the most fundamental... Oh, this is, this is actually more polarized than I thought. This is from August 31st, 2020. So this would have been in the lead-up to the election that he lost. Trump's popularity slips in the latest Military Times poll, and more troops say they'll vote for Biden. 50% um, of respondents had an unfavorable view of President Trump, compared to 38% who had a favorable view. That's... not bad, you know? From 2020, though? Yeah, yeah. But at the end of his presidency. Yeah, Trump would shit on soldiers constantly. He leaked information to our enemies. He praised our enemies. You know, he did a lot of stuff to, uh, you know, get the troops negatively inclined. Hold on. Uh, U.S. Army political polling. Any more recent uh, new polling data? suggests active duty military members worry about the politicization of the U.S. military. To decrease the trust active members of the military, include the changing policy to allow unrestricted service by transgender individuals. Uh, when is this from? 2023? Uh, so it seems 80% of active duty uh, members in the military believe that returning to the Pentagon's previous policy of allowing unrestricted service by trans people uh, makes them worry like lowers their trust in the military. All right, sorry guys, the military might be transphobic. But who knows what these guys, they probably say they're homophobic, but they're all f each other. Wait, wait, hold on. This is from Heritage. Wait, hold on. I thought I was on military times. I forgot. This is from Heritage. Never mind. You can't trust any of this. Hold on. Back it up. Yep, yep, yep. Hold it way back. Yeah, I'm not doing a whole methodology deep dive, but the Heritage Foundation is one of the pillars of evil. Uh, yeah, yeah, the Project 2025 people. Yeah, I wouldn't, uh, classic pick of us soldiers watching Vosh. Yeah, that's true. This is, uh, standard deployment stuff. How could the military possibly be, uh, conservative when this is the shit they're watching while on deployment? These motherfuckers about to go airdrop into Syria, uh, getting some, some pointers. Truth about this country. Unlike other nations on Earth, America is not built on ethnicity, religion, geography, we're the only nation in the history of the world built on an idea. This is not true, of course, uh, at all. Not hyperbole, built on an idea. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal. It's an idea declared in the Declaration, created in a way that we view everybody you guys equal and be, should be treated equal throughout their lives. We've never fully lived up to that. We have a long way to go. But we've never walked away from the idea. We've never walked away from it. And I promise you, I will not let Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans <laughs> force us to walk away now. That's facts to them. We're living in an era where a determined minority is doing everything in its power to try to destroy our democracy for their own agenda. The American people know it. 
and they're standing bravely in the breach. Remember after 2020, January 6th insurrection to undo the election in which more Americans had- The speech is incredibly weak. It's Hillary Trump bad rhetoric. I, I disagree. It's nowhere near as bad as Hillary. The main thing that I would do to improve it and the main thing that Democrats hate doing because they hate winning and they hate life and they, they, they all want to curl up into a ball and suck their thumbs um, is that uh, I think that- um, Democrats should more aggressively ridicule and lambast Republican leaders for not doing anything for their constituents. It's go on and on about how it's every cultural point. First, it's this destroying the country, then that. Then you hear about this and what changes? Nothing. You get these people, they get you angry, they give you nothing because all they care about is getting your vote and that's it. You know, point out the fact that Donald Trump really didn't really do much during his presidency, you know? Like, to, uh, mock inconsistencies, you know? They say uh, they won't take the vaccine. They don't like the lockdowns. Well, you know what? Donald Trump was the one who came up with Operation Warp Speed. He pushed the vaccine. He still does, you know? They just don't want you to linger on it because it might make you question. Stuff like that. Like, lean on shit like that. Um, I think that's much more effective. You don't want to insult the average Republican voter because that's just bad politics. It's just bad political theory. And, uh, you know, you don't want to limit your insults just to Trump because it's more than just a Trump issue. I think that you should force, you know, I, 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 I think that you should, you know, make an issue of that, essentially make a mockery of it. But this is a speech about Jan 6, not about that. Oh, but you could easily apply that to January 6, you know, how, how, how Trump, you know, uh, grifted hundreds of millions in donations from his, uh, from his followers to support dozens of legal cases, all of which failed lie after lie after lie that they've been legally forced to retract. They would show you one story, then another every time it falls through. But by the time you learn how they lied about the last one, they've got a new lie for you. You know, talk about how he feels bad for Republican voters, stuff like that. I think that would sell pretty good, you know. Voters than any other in American history. America saw the threat posed to the country. And they voted him out. In 2022, historic midterm election. In state after state, election after election, the election deniers were defeated. Now in 2024, Trump is winning as the denier in chief. The election denier in chief. Once again, he's saying he won't honor the results of the election if he loses. Trump says he doesn't understand. Well, he still doesn't understand the basic truth. And that is, you can't love your country only when you win. You can't love your country only when you win. This bothers me again, too, because Republicans don't love their country. They love white supremacy, the idea of curb stomping black people, deporting brown people, whatever, I don't know, having sex with a trans person and then doing a hate crime against them, Wh whatever they think, whatever occupies the mind of Republicans. They don't love this country. And frankly, the average Democrat doesn't either. Again, institutional appeals just don't work that well to the average person. It's, it's too big. It's too abstract. You need to appeal to people's direct and immediate interests, fears, insecurities, whatever else, you know? I don't like this, like, this hypocritical, you know, they claim to love it, but they lost, and they should accept that. Like, it, it's just too, it's just too basic. Yeah, and I, and I agree, Somnio, it's, it's too, it's too divorced from self-interest. Is that why I want Republicans to lose? Because they aren't consistent in loving the country, whether or not they win or lose? No, I don't care how they feel about it. That, that, I don't care even a little about that. Well, I'll keep my commitment to be president for all of America, whether you voted for me or not. I saw Rumpel I've done it for the last it's, three it's years, years and I'll continue I can't to really do it. work with that. Together, we can keep proving that America is still a country that believes in decency, dignity, honesty, honor, truth. We still believe that no one, not even the president, is above the law. We still believe. The vast majority of us still believe that everyone deserves a fair and stuff like this too. The idea of um, the idea of a monarch being held below the law was impressive back during the Magna Carta or whatever. But the idea of a sort of um, legalist regime is the norm everywhere. I mean, even in openly authoritarian governments like the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany, there was still an effort to present the rule of the leader in the context of legality, you know, like, no, they didn't want anyone thinking Stalin or Hitler was walking around like some some sultan waving their arm and doing stuff. It was all, you know, 
for the Republic. It was all procedural. So this, again, this is like, it's too... I mean, you're essentially asking people to, like, conjure a historical comparison from before the Enlightenment in order for this to... It's just a phrase, really. It's an empty phrase. No one's above the law. Okay, so what you're saying is that they did a crime. Okay, and just say that. It's, but it's being it's being delivered at the end of a statement. I don't know. I I guess it's just it's just frustrating to me that like Donald Trump will go up on stage and he'll be like, the immigrants are going to kill you. Transgender homosexuals are raping your kids. You need to vote for me, or there's not even going to be a country. And then like you and Biden is like talking about how you know we you know the greatness of the American spirit must continue to be lived forward whether whether not he wins yeah like it's it's not just an energy thing it, it, it's just again like how well can you pull on people's heartstrings shot at making it we're still a nation that gives hate no safe harbor this like this i tell you from my experience working with leaders around the world and i mean it sincerely not a joke that America is still viewed as the beacon of democracy for the world. The I ideal and importance of loving the country is a sign of somebody who already has all their fundamental needs met. To a large extent, yeah, I think so. Kind of a higher order uh, need there. Um, not really a strong appeal. I can't tell you how many, how many world leaders, and I know all of them, virtually all of them, grab my arm in private and say, you can't win. Tell me. No. My country will be at risk. Think of how many countries, Tommy, you know that are on the, burn, on the edge. Imagine. We still believe in we the people. And that includes all of us, not some of us. I, I actually believe him when he says this. For the most part, the world fucking despises Trump. Um, that being said, this makes him look quite weak. I don't like it. Um, you know, it, like the idea of him commiserating with a bunch of foreign leaders foreigners oh i hope trump doesn't win yeah it makes him look it makes him look weak you know uh, why why appeal to the interests of foreign countries this is an american election you know I, I it's i mean you can say like no one around the world wants trump to win here i ask you who but a biden voter would be swayed by somebody saying did you know foreign leaders don't want trump to win let me close with this in the coal winter of 1777, George Washington and his American troops of Valley Forge waged the battle on behalf of a revolutionary idea that everyday people like where I come from and the vast majority of you, not a king or a dictator, that everyday people can govern themselves without a king or a dictator. In fact, in the rotunda of the Capitol, there's a giant painting of General George Washington, not President Washington, and he is resigning his commission as commander in chief of the Continental Army. A European king at the, at the time said after he won the revolution, now's the time for him to declare his kingship. I saw Hamilton. And instead, the mob that attacked the Capitol, waving Trump flags and Confederate flags, stormed right past that portrait. <clears throat> the image of George Washington gave them no pause, but it should have. The artist who painted that portrait memorialized that moment because he said it was, quote, one of the highest moral lessons ever given to the world. End of quote. George Washington was the height of his power, having just defeated the most powerful empire on earth. Could have held on to power as long as he wanted. Again, I just don't think people care about this stuff. When fascists make appeal to history, they're usually making general, largely inaccurate, vague appeals to a bloodline. You know, like when when Donald Trump says the blood of America used to be strong, he he's saying white people like the and people watching him who support him know that he means white people or at the very least a kind of like vague notion of American exceptionalism, which they don't interpret as white nationalism, but is still coded heavily as white nationalism. But it's not like they don't literally care about George Washington, you know, like they, they, they don't actually care whether or not he suspended his you know his, his his generalship or you know stepped down as president it's 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 always just meant to be appeal to the the you know the volk he could have made himself not a future president but a future monarch in effect 
And by the way, when he got elected president, he could have stayed for two, three, four, five terms till he died. But that wasn't the America he and the American troops of Valley Forge had fought for. In America, genuine leaders, democratic leaders with a small d, don't hold on to power relentlessly. Our leaders return power to the people, and they do it willingly, because that's the deal. You do your duty. You serve your country. And ours is a country worthy of service, as many Republican presidents and Democratic presidents have shown over the years. We're not perfect, but at our best, we face, on, we face head on the good, the bad, the truth of who we are. We look in the mirror and ultimately never pretend we're something we're not. That's what great nations do. And we're a great nation. We're the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We really are. I, I know I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but I just have to insist over and over and over again how ineffective rhetorical appeals like this are. The, this it it, it 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 echoes Hillary Clinton's like America is already great attitude. Nobody nobody gets up out of bed and like goes out there and storms a capital to preserve the status quo. But liberal appeals must always be couched in the appeal to the status quo because the status quo is what liberals are definitionally defending. At least now, not always, but now. So, you know, it, it has to be, yeah, America's great already, don't let Trump ruin it. it America's got a f ton of problems, dude. What have you promised to do to fix any of them, even in the context of this speech? Even implicitly, I know it's about Jan 6, but like, he's not even really talked about what Trump would do to f country up, you know? The only meaningful difference between Trump and Biden that I'm aware of, if I only were to watch this spe uh, this speech, nothing else, would be Biden believes in the rule of law and he really likes America and he likes old American leaders, whereas Donald Trump lies a lot and he wants to be a dictator. That's not a lot to go off of. Again, my problem with, uh, you know, Donald Trump winning is not just the dictatorship thing. That's bad. Sure. It's a lot of it's also what he wants to do. As a dictator, that also gets me, you know, Biden doesn't want to scare the hose. Yeah, that's true. Liberals will hate the speech. <laughs> no. No, they quite like it. It's it's a better speech by his standards, you know. Don't you think this rhetoric is more for the rich donors than the people? No, I don't. I, I don't. I don't think that. I um I think that for the most part, rich donors understand that the rhetoric employed by the politicians they've bought and paid for uh, are for the voters. You know, the whole point of using politicians as a proxy for your business interests is that the politicians have to appeal to the people. If they have to appeal to the people and also sound good for the donors, like rhetorically, they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot. That's America I see in our future. We get up. We carry on. We never bow. We never bend. We speak of possibilities, not carnage. We're not weighed down by grievances. We don't foster fear. We don't walk around as victims. We take charge of our destiny. Responding to your claims about the military leading uh, Democrats. Sorry, Vosh 2020 in-depth dive for voting in the election tendencies. Okay, so these are for veterans. Trump backed by majority of veterans, but not younger ones. Interesting. 52% of vets surveyed said they plan to back Trump or have already backed him in early voting. About 42% say Biden. This is veterans, too, not active service members, which means they're going to be on older on average. So, uh, But what about younger people? Trump's support among veterans comes predominantly from individuals age 55 or older. The older generation of veterans is the only subgroup surveyed with a larger favorable view of Trump's time in office than unfavorable. Nice. Among veterans who first enlisted or entered the officer corps after 2001, after the Afghanistan war, about 60% say they have a negative view of his presidency. Okay, so this is, so it doesn't take very long for you to reach the, like, ice core layer of veterans who don't care for Trump as much. And that's literally, like, Gen Xers, you know, who would have enlisted, like, back for Afghanistan or Vietnam. Veterans aged 35 to 54 were even more pronounced in their opposition to the current president. 51% plan to back Biden. Okay, yeah, see, see, this is what I mean, huh? Uh, for, it's just the older vets, and this isn't active service members or whatever, this is just veterans, but, um, you know, you see more of this. I, I see a lot of support for Biden shifted to the independents, the third party candidates here, that's interesting. Whereas Trump support's pretty comparable, it's like four points moved over, whatever. Um, anyway, I, 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 this is, this is tangential, but I stand by this, I just, like, 
keep an eye on the Pentagon, but for the moment, just don't buy into the idea that a lot of people have that every single guy in the military is some kind of like ultra right wing fascist because that's just not true. It's, that's that's bullshit. You know, this is from 2020. Yes, this is from 2020. Get our job done with the people, with help of the people we find in America who find their place in the changing world and dream and build a future that not only they, but all people deserve a shot at. We don't believe, none of you believe America's failing. We know America's- Yeah, yeah, this is, dude, this is what I mean, man. The people, especially young people these days, like wake up every day waiting for the collapse. Like pessimism is at literally record levels right now. So to go up there, while Donald Trump is saying there are problems in this country and he'll fix them, and, and Biden to be like, dude, things are fine, man. Like, this does not... Liberals, they insist on doing this. Winning. That's American patriotism. <clears throat> it's not winning because of Joe Biden. It's winning. This is the first national election since January 6th. Insurrection placed a dagger at the throat of American democracy since that moment. We all know who Donald Trump is. The question we have to answer is, who are we? That's what's at stake. Who are we? In the year ahead, as you talk to your family and friends, cast your ballots, the power is in your hands. After all we've been through in our history, from independence to civil war, to two world wars, to a pandemic, to insurrection, I refuse to believe then in 2024, we Americans will choose to walk away from what's made us the greatest nation in the history of the world. Freedom, liberty, <laughs> democracy is still a sacred cause. And there's no country in the world better positioned to lead the world than America. That's why. I've said it many times, that's why I've never been more optimistic about our future. And I've been doing this a hell of a long time. Just to remember who we are with patience and fortitude. Oh, this rhetoric is so trash. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I've said this before. A lot of people ask me, like liberals, they, they ask this, they, they, they gurgle this at me through their, their, their sort of slimy, um, you know, their, their, their sort of um, mucus. Uh, uh, what's a gross word for a hole, but doesn't, isn't just hole? Because that's a horny word now. Orifice? Yeah, I guess orifice. Yeah, I think I was struggling for the word orifice there. Yeah, they're, they're gurgling. Uh, a slimy orifice. What was I saying? Liberals! That's right. They ask me, well, what do you have Biden do to oppose the Republicans? You know, like, what would you actually meaningfully do? And the main thing that Biden and the Democrats don't do is they don't talk. Rhetorically, they are, they are, 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 are being, they, they get encircled by the Republicans. The Republicans get to decide the news every single day. They decide the talking points. They are being, like, they're running laps around them. You know, the Republicans might be tards, but being retarded doesn't keep you out of the Oval Office. That's the whole thing. You need to engage with people's thoughts and feelings, not just, you know, loftily gesture at. Is this video footage from the White House from PBS interlaced? Did they, are they, are they using an old camera? It's interlaced. I haven't seen an interlacing artifact. Broadcast TV is interlaced. Well, no, wait, no, no, no. Um, isn't broadcast TV all digital? They switched over back in 2008. Is it, is it, did they still interlace it even though they don't have to? There's such a thing as 1080i? Yeah, but I thought that was like a stylistic choice. What is interlaced? Look, look, look at his hands, these vertical bars. Or, sorry, horizontal bars. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, you've seen it before. It's a thing that makes videos play at a higher frame rate, even though they don't have the temporal resolution and they do it by running the scan lines, uh, every other vertical pixel. It was back in the day when it wasn't digital. There weren't pixels because there are pixels here, which is the thing we're looking at pixel data. So you don't need to interlace pixels because there are pixels, but for CRT TVs, CRT TVs didn't have pixels that ran from left to right. They just had lines that uh, magnetic cables would bend a beam of electromagnetic. I thought the interlation happened on the actual display, not the actual signal. Well, yeah, that's what I'm curious about. Now, some cameras, good ones, will like free account for the interlaced footage, but this is a digital feed, which means that either this camera interlaced footage when it doesn't need to, or I'm watching something that was recorded off of 
an interlaced traditional broadcast. Like, like there was an original file that got put out to digital tape. Yeah, but that doesn't, digital tape doesn't change the fact that we're talking about scan lines and a, a, a nothing, never mind. Whatever, whatever. It's fine. One heart. We are the United States of America, for God's sake. I mean it. There is nothing. I believe in every fiber, there is nothing beyond our capacity if we act together and decently with one another. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I mean it. We're the only nation in the world that's come out of every crisis stronger than when we went into that crisis. <clears throat> that was true yesterday. It is true today. And I guarantee you, it will be true tomorrow. God bless you all and may God protect our troops. See, that's why the troops like Biden. Uh, it's because he says, may God protect our troops. This is a special resolution. Uh, yeah, 1080, 1080i. Uh, so some of the Bandwidth benefits only apply to analog or uncompressed digital video. Like with digital video compression used in all current digital TV standards, interlacing adduces additional uh, inefficiencies. This is what I'm talking about. Why would you, for, for something that gets put out on a video broadcast, regardless of the method you're using to record it, the idea of there being interlacing introduced when this is going to, yeah, it's up compression. I mean, I guess it's fine. It's not really an issue. It's just interesting. I don't know. Because the camera? Yeah, the camera pre-interlaces. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm saying is weird. In, 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 an, in an era where you, a lot of stuff gets uploaded online, like it's not like it's not like the interlacing effect couldn't be like managed afterwards. You know, it's like you could just record at 60 FPS. It's not like that would stop modern cameras. OK, whatever. A lot of digital tape cameras from 2000, 2014 were like this. Yeah. OK, so it's, it's an older thing. I mean, it's just. Yeah. OK. All right. Oh, wait, was that Coldplay? Oh my god, it was. You're even saying it in chat. Holy shit. Who, who chooses these? Opening on Hamilton and closing on Coldplay. This is truly a, a man of the people. If by the people you mean, you mean annoying Gen X homosexuals. Millennials? Can Coldplay be more of a... Nah, I guess it'd be more of a millennial thing, not a Gen X thing. Whatever. Okay. Close that. What did we learn today? We learned that PBS still uses digital interlacing for its cameras and nothing else. All right.